service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please rise as we sing our first hymn, 172 in the Blue. service can be found on page 25. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will. And true obedience to your word, that by your grace, we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes 
and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. like to follow along in your Bibles. Uh, Our first lesson comes from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 35, starting at verse 4. That can be found on page 1112 in the Bibles in your pews. Isaiah 35, beginning at verse 4. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, he will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer. And the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling with springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Our second lesson comes from the book of 2 Thessalonians. That can be found on page 1843 in your pew Bible. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the Lord, the day of the Lord has already come. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will come until the re- that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret of... for the. Uh, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who knows now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless of and then the lawless one will be revealed, 
whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of lawless, of the lawless one, will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Here ends our second lesson for this morning. The gospel reading this morning is taken from Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. Please rise. Matthew 25, beginning with verse 1, subtitled, The Parable of the Ten Virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go out to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready, were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Here ends the gospel reading. Let us confess the words of the Apostles' Creed, our common faith on page 32. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In preparation for the message, hymn 124 in the blue.
message this morning is taken from the book of Ezekiel. If you want to turn to your Bibles, it's Ezekiel 34, beginning with verse 11. It's 11 through 16, and it's titled, The Lord Will Seek. And this is a message that Pastor Hart actually delivered at Faith a week ago. So he prepared the, the core of this message, and we are thankful for Pastor Hart and his, his service to us and making our lives a lot easier for those that present in this congregation. So Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16. And before we begin, let's begin. In Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to bring your message to you, to, to your people, Father. And, and we just pray for opening ears and eyes and hearts and minds, Father, that, that this message would uh, pierce our hearts and help us to walk out of here fully understanding your desire for, for your involvement, your love for us, your mercy, your grace in our lives, that we would seek others out to know you. And all these things, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in your house of worship this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16, and, and before I get started here, for those of you that missed the, uh, the Bible study this morning, Harlan already has covered all this, and he could basically give the message this morning, but uh, I may have to defer to him in certain parts of the message, but I will not do that to you, Harlan, but, but uh, it is very good. Ezekiel 34, verse 11, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements of the land. And I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. And I will shepherd the flock with justice. The message this morning is talk, talks about sheep, and, and for some of us here that actually uh, had sheep as a side business, I don't, I don't claim to be an expert in, in the raising and, and management of sheep, but we actually did purchase some from, from Murray several years ago, so it was pretty interesting. Sheep are an interesting creature, and they have unique characteristics about them. In fact, they actually have personalities, which is really hard to believe, but they do all have a separate personality and individuality about them. But one thing that they do have, they don't have a lot of fight to them, and they do need a caretaker and a shepherd. That is really evident. Cattle today you can put out in a pasture. You don't have to worry about them. Sheep are a totally different thing. And they are very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. They're cons they usually consist of, of weak. They're considered weak. But they constantly need the caretaker to be, be with them, to take care of them. There are many instances of sheep in the, in the Bible, several that more than we can, we can really notate today. But the, what's interesting in Ezekiel is God calls his people as sheep because they continually strayed up to this point. No different than today's world. And God always comes back and calls people back to his own. So Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel describes God's chosen people unfortunately, rejecting their shepherd and suffering the consequences of their actions. So leading up to this passage depicts the Babylonian exile that took place in 597 B.C. When Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar responded to a rebellion in Judah by laying siege to Jerusalem, forcing Jerusalem's most prominent citizens into exile into Babylonia, 
and carrying off all the treasures from the temple of the Lord and the king's royal palace, and cutting up in pieces all the vessels of gold, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple as God had directed. In the exile directive, Nebuchadnezzar carried away all Jerusalem, all of it, all the princes, all the officers, the mighty men of Israel, in addition to 10,000 captives along with all the craftsmen, leaving only the poorest of the people of the land. And you can find description of that in 2 Kings 24, 13, and 14. So God's people truly needed his encouragement. They had been scattered because as a nation they had turned away from God. They had blended Judaism together with the religions of the surrounding nations with terrible results. Even sacrificing babies in the valley just south of Jerusalem. And you can find the accounts of that, gross details, very vivid details of that in Ezekiel chapter 16. In fact, if you read in Ezekiel, they, the Israelites of that day were considered by the Lord worse than the people of Sodom. That's how terrible it was. It's no wonder, no wonder they were punished for what they, were, what they did. So that was the reason why they had now lost their nation. They had broken their covenant with Almighty God. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Looking at the world today, and more in particular, our great country, it's truly disturbing to witness how this great nation has intentionally removed Christ from our schools and institutions in pursuit of the God's of passion and desire. One has to ask, are we much better? I did some research and, and they talk about the killing of babies on the east side of Jerusalem in the valley. I looked up on the National Right to Life website and since 1973, 64 million babies have been aborted. And about 900,000 annually. We are, we are no different than the Israelites back in the day. As for the Israelites, they are now, they now were scattering. The prophet Ezekiel wasn't exempt from this exile because of his faith. And he was one of the many who were taken to the region around Babylon, to the distant east of Jerusalem, staying there for 70 years. 70 years, Harlan. In the midst of all this confusion, fear, and despair, God appears, speaking to his people through Ezekiel, that he would seek them out. Like a shepherd searching for lost sheep, God promised to rescue them and gather them and finally bring them back to their homeland. Throughout those 70 years in exile, God would be watching over them. The one who is God in Jerusalem is also God over Babylon, regardless of the Babylonian gods. In those 70 years away from their homeland, they would eventually rid themselves of their worship of foreign gods who weren't even real. Quit sacrificing children, and while residing in a foreign land, rediscover how important the one real God is to them. Today, thankfully for a different reason, Christians are scattered throughout the world. They spread out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee into Greek lands, into Roman lands, and Asian lands. Today, almost every country has at least some Christians living in it, a chosen people who can spread the good news about Christ. Someday, all of God's people will be gathered in a homeland with God. For now, in some places, the good news has been welcomed. In some places, it is met with hostility. And Jesus has warned his people that it would be that way. And why? Why, is, why are Christians treated that way? In both Judaism and Christianity, Christianity, people are called to live a different kind of life. 
People are called to a loyalty to God above everything else. People are called to recognize some things is wrong that we call sin, even though our human nature at times desires those things. People are called to give up things like selfishness and violence and deceit and are called to a life of growing patience and humility and generosity. In other words, Christ calls us to a higher standard. And in response to this calling, we as a people of God are called to trust Him first and acknowledge that He is all-powerful and seek out the truth. Matthew 7, 31-33 describes this situation. So do not worry, Jesus saying, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, all these things will be given to you as well. Unfortunately, the life that God calls people to live is an offense to our broken human nature. Now, in some places, Christians are called to keep the faith even when life is very comfortable and it is, and it is so easy to drift away from God. Now, isn't that, the, isn't that the, tr the truth with us as well? When life is easy, we tend to drift away, placing our emphasis on us. In other places, Christians are called to keep the faith while facing threats and enduring violence and receiving persecution. There is an organization called Open Doors that every year publishes a world watch list. They keep track of what's happening in every country, and then they use all that information to rank the 50 countries where Christians are being targeted for the most severe persecution. So what did they find? in 2023. To start with, one out of every seven Christians in the world is being persecuted because of their faith in Christ. That's about 15 percent. More than 360 million Christians are experiencing high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith in Christ today. Over 5,600 Christians were murdered last year because of their faith. Over 2,100 churches were attacked, and over 4,500 Christians were detained. The worst place for Christians to live in today's world is North Korea. Just having a Bible in one's possession is a serious crime and will be met with sternly punished, stern punishment. The rulers there insist that everyone gives the government absolute supreme loyalty and do not tolerate Christians having a loyalty that is much higher than that. That means that if the government finds out about someone's faith in Christ, that believer is either sent to a labor camp or is killed right then and there together with that person's family. Pretty tough stuff. It's illegal to meet for worship, but praise God that some have the courage and take the risk of worshiping in secret. And even though it is dangerous to be a Christian, there are an estimated, this is unbelievable, there's an estimated 400,000 Christians residing in that country. What an enormous risk that they do take. But knowing full well and trust that Jesus is worth it to them. Those are just a few of our fellow Christians that, your family in, that are your family in Christ that you and I can pray for. Next on the list is the second most dangerous country for a Christian to reside is a Somalia in East Africa. Here's, a, here's an individual that actually escaped, and this is her, her witness of that, of that event. Nala, a former escaped resident of Somalia and converted Christian, gives this account of her life there. When she got home, the men in my family were waiting for me. They beat me and took my cell phone and they locked me up in a room. They said, we have heard that you are corrupted, but they never once used the word Christian. 
Nala lived and she was able to get away from her homeland to somewhere safe. But in Somalia, the violence has grown worse. Militants now have intensified their hunt for Christians. Christian girls who are very young are forced into marriages with older men. And these husbands will forcibly try to rehabilitate these girls through physical violence and pressure, all to coerce them to renounce Jesus. Lots of prayers needed for people overseas. So how many Christians are there in Somalia? Probably only a few hundred. However, each one of them valued by God. Each one of them bound for an eternity with God. In this report, there's also some good news. In the Persian Gulf area, countries like the Emirates and Bahrain are rapidly becoming more tolerant of Christians. At the same time, they have also been working toward peace and cooperation with Israel. So, is persecution a signal that God has abandoned it, those people in those places? When God's people were enduring hardship in the desert around Babylon, was that a signal that God had abandoned them as they traveled, traveled into those distant lands? Sometimes the only treasure that a person has during these tough situations is the Word of God. And what a value that Word is. And we've read this morning, you could feather that into our gospel reading with the ten virgins of the oil in the lamps and how important it is that we are in the Word and that we keep our lamps filled at all times. But Hebrews 4.12 describes this Word. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of man. The words from prophet Ezekiel must have sounded so good to the people of Israel as they were being taken further and further away from home. They had been scattered. Babylon had come in with their big powerful armies and trampled their country. The temple had been knocked down. Jerusalem had been burned down to the ground with its protective walls ruined. A few of the people had been left in the land. Some had escaped to Egypt. Many were taken to Babylon as prisoners. Ezekiel described it as a time of clouds and thick darkness. It was a time when it would be easy to think that God had finally given up on them and that he had, didn't see them anymore and that he didn't care for them anymore and that God ultimately had forsaken them. Babylon, with all the impressive buildings, gardens, and pyramids, was not the place where the people of Israel wanted to be. It was a strange land with a strange culture and strange language, strange gods. They were clearly outsiders. How were they supposed to seek the Lord in that strange land? Would they even be able to seek Him? As it surely wouldn't have been any better in Egypt. Same holds true today. It isn't any easier to live in North Korea, Somalia, or any other countries on the list of oppressors. Scripture shows a counter-cultural way to live. And Scripture shows us a different way to live, different priorities, different goals, different way to treat other people, all according to the eternal ways in God's home. Even here in our own country, it can seem like living in a strange land. In some places, just having the nativity scene up or saying Merry Christmas can cause a strong negative reaction. Some people are offended these days at the concept of a husband and wife submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Offended at the concept that love means that you do not insist on your own way. Instead, marriage is often thought of as a struggle of power, which is not how God designed it. We find examples of teachers who have taken a student's Bible and dropped it in the trash can. Other gods are more popular than the real God. The gods that we make up will let us do things that the real God will warn us about 
and confront. The gods that we put above the real God allow us to be selfish, while the real God calls us to mercy and generosity. The fake gods do not tell us to repent and forgive. The gods that we make up and that we make a priority above the true God are not good for us. And in the long run, they rob us of joy and they rob us of peace. Money, power, relationships, drugs, even sports are not necessarily gods, even though it's easy to let them be more important and crowd out the real God in our daily lives. The one real God who made the universe, who designed families, who initiated a plan to save us, and who constantly watches over us, is the one who we need to listen to and follow and respect and love if we have any sense within us. Ezekiel proclaimed that the day was coming when God would come and search for his sheep wherever they were. And he will find them. He knows each one of them. He recognizes their voices. They are not forsaken. They are not abandoned. They are not forgotten. He will gather them, feed them, tend to them, strengthen them, and ultimately give them rest. After 70 years, God's people were allowed to go back into their homeland in Israel. But there is a bigger rescue here. The good shepherd, the rescuer, the son of God, Jesus Christ, entered into this world as one of us to bring each one of us hope and salvation. For those who are lost, for those who are persecuted for their faith, for those who have wandered away from their faith, for those who live in prosperous places where it's so easy to drift away from God because life is so comfortable, And for those who live in places where trusting in God can result in hardship, in families that reject you because of your faith, in bosses that will fire you because of your faith, in neighbors who will harass you because of your faith, in authorities who will imprison you and sometimes kill you because of your faith, Jesus has come. And Jesus has rejoiced coming to us and saving you and I on that first Christmas day. And he will rejoice again on that day when he comes to gather his people together forever. Mark 13, 26 and 27 describes that time. And at that time... They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. You are his joy. He loves his people more than anything in this world, and he wants his people to live with him forever. And while we wait... We might live in peace or persecution or prosperity or even in hardship, but Jesus is with you always to the very end of the age. So we wait patiently. We wait for him to make this world new, where there will be no more sin, no more violence, no more wars, no more evil, no more death, no more sorrow sorrow, being faithful to his call, and anchored in this passage from Romans 5, 1 through 2, therefore since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So while we wait for his glorious return, may our lives 
and our voices show Jesus to the world. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for this message, and we thank you for your work in our lives, seeking us out always, and we just pray that you would work in our lives going forward here and in the lives of all your people, Father, in Jesus' name. And we thank you and give you the glory and honor. Amen. We'll take the offering at this time. We do thank you. We thank you for this opportunity that we can come and worship without fear, without punishment, and we just, without persecution, Father, and we just thank you for that, and we just thank you for the message today that even though we do scatter, we do stray from you, that you're always there. Bring us back to green pastures, Father to seek out all and save everyone, want everyone to be saved, Father. And we just pray, Father, that we, we would each be diligent in that work, Father, that you would work through us to bring others to know you, Father. For we do know that the, the, the path is wide to destruction, but we do know the path is narrow, and we want those that are all around us to be able to go down that path, Father to you in eternity. Father, we think of this country, we think of how we've strayed, just as the Israelites have strayed. We are no better than they. We just pray for revival of this country that godly men and women would step forward and lead a revival in this country that puts you first in all things. We pray for our government officials as the elections come near that you bring godly counsel, godly people, to serve in those capacities. Father, we think of the AFLC as well, and, and we pray for the AFLC that, that you would guide and direct them and uh, blanket them, Father, with your grace and grant them wisdom and discernment in all their decisions uh, at, at headquarters, Father. We thank you for all the, the churches under the AFLC and many without a pastor, we pray for those, and, and we pray as well as for us that you deliver a, pa a pastor and a shepherd to us. We think of those that are having health concerns. We, th we think of Christy and, and Amanda Bowling, and we think of Judy and Annie and Cindy and Karen, Father, and many others that are on our hearts. We pray that you would heal them, comfort them, and strengthen them, Father, during this time. We think of our nursing home residents, Edna and Helen and Marjorie. We think of our school students and the pressures that they deal with each day. We pray that you would surround them and bring godly counsel around them and godly friends, that, that, that would, they would be a shining example of Christ in their lives. And we think of the military individuals of Aaron Buckles and the veterans, that you would blanket and protect them as well. Father, we also think of our AFLC missionary, Nate, and Rhoda Jory in Uganda. Father, we pray that you would protect them, and Father, that their ministry would expand 
and that they would be effective in their roles of your work through them, Father. Father, all these things we just ask, and, and we thank you for this past week of Thanksgiving, and you give, receive all the thanks and glory for what we have, for we are nothing without you. And we thank you and praise you, and we pray, pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As we close this service, we'll sing hymn 539 in the blue. Excellent.